welcome back to another episode of Set the Table. I am John, and with me is Jack. How's it going, eh? And this is episode 14, Improv Skills. Um, we're talking about what that means, why you should have it, and uh, hoping to try to, to do something that is pretty universal to whatever roleplay game system you are using. Um, but like we like to do, um, talk about the games that we each have played in the past two weeks. Uh, we played 7C, and that has been a lot of fun, uh, continuing on. Um, we didn't get to play this week, but that's okay. We'll, uh, we'll pick it up again. Um, but I, I like where it's going. I like that we took something that wasn't a big hook and turned it into a hook. <laughs> um, you broke up. Oh. Sorry, uh, I said that I liked in 7C that we took something that wasn't a hook and turned it into a hook. Yes. Uh, and that's yeah, now... it's uh, it's going to become canon, right? I mean, so <laughs> we're 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 play testing a module I'm trying to write for the Explorers League, uh, and I've kind of there's there's certain pieces of the document I want to leave open for other. GMs to be creative. Like I, I don't want to write one of these on the. You know, we talked about during the modules episode, right? Rails. Yep. And like, I have a thread that I want to present to a seventh C GM, but I don't want to put Rails. So I hear you there. So the um and and that's important with seventh C. I know we haven't done our seventh C deep dive, but um. It's a much different type of system than 5e. Uh, it's much more cooperative, kind of uh, much more like a fate or even a fiasco where the the GM is there to kind of provide some structure and then you players can spend raises and change the narrative. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I want to write a module that is presents an interesting story and a nice set, an interesting setting. Some really uh, yucky villains that that everyone is going to dislike, and then uh, and see where it goes. Well, all right. Well, I am looking forward to seeing where it goes as well. Uh, I think we've taken it in places that you didn't expect, um, and we may need to do more than one playthrough if you're going to try to see what different groups of characters might do in different situations. I, I might I might actually try and uh, hoodwink my Monday night group into running it as a one off or a or a a mini session. Nice. nice. Um, and and then I'll have two separate teams who have gone through it, and and I'll I'll see kind of which of the action scenes and which of the dramatic scenes make sense and fit and everyone kind of enjoys. And then if there's one that you know, wow, I spent all this time writing this dramatic sequence and no one ever goes to the governor's tea party. <laughs> then, you know, I'll leave it in there because who knows, right? Yeah. But I won't give it prominence. I'll make it a sidebar or a, I'll put it someplace else in the document instead of kind of front and center as a, like, like I have a list of recommended sequences. Mm. Like here, here's, here's the basic story sequence. Um, and the, here's where things can plug in. Uh, and then I have some like side, if you will, side quests. I hate to use a video game term. No, that's, that's kind of. That's good. You know. So you guys definitely took the bait on a side quest and you turned it into your main story, which is, which is, that's what 7th C is all about. Cool, cool. Which yeah, is very. Well, it's, well, we were taught, that's what we need to talk about next. What we're going to do with those dang letters. Yes. What are you going to do with the blackmail letters, which... No um, spoilers. <laughs> no spoilers. No spoilers. Nope. It'll be interesting to see what you guys come up with. You already burned one. Yeah. I mean, you, you burned the the forgery. Yep. So... Yep, we have so the letters. That'll be interesting to see what happens next. Yeah, I think so. Um, 
my Sunday group uh, played some 5e. They are in a awful town called, well, awful city called Prosperous. Um, and they are, are kind of booping around, investigating little bits of things here and there. Uh, but I tried to have it, I, I, I tried to not have as many rails, and I need to, I've talked about that before on the show, and I've talked about that before with you, I need to just do that for this group more often, I think, and it's just me trying to get over uh, a DM hurdle to make myself do that more. Um, but they well, are, you, they're not so you stuck, don't... but they just don't. They, none of them feel compelled to do any of the things that they're presented with. So so you as a player, you find a narrative and you stick to it. Yeah, I mean, if new right? stuff is presented, I'll, I'll, you know, if I need to change gears for a minute, I will. But all I'm, all I'm saying is that as a player... You like to you like to have agency and you like to kind of drive your own narrative. That's why I think you're having so much fun with Seventh C. But yes. I I think we we talk about this in software design, uh, mirroring, and you you you'll you'll know the psychology term. Mm -hmm. um, but in software design, it's a bad idea to assume that your users are like yourself, uh, and and I think you're kind of. It sounds like, and I, again, I'm not in your group, so I'm, I can't say for certain, but it sounds like you're kind of presenting them with lots of hooks and no one's driving that narrative. Yeah, yeah, or it's just it's the, the driving isn't urgent. It's, you know, 15 miles an hour down a scenic route without without a, a clear goal or destination the, or the threat quest. to drive you so, forward. So my, my, it's funny you, you say that my Monday group is kind of in the same space. Um, we've, it's, it's a, it's a neat adventure. It really is. We're basically in prison and, uh, we're, what's the, um, we're, we're kind of prisoners that help the guards. And there's a term for that. Double um, agents. Snitches. No, 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 we're not. No, it's, it's the, um, gosh, I forget. I haven't seen Shawshank Redemption in a hundred years, but, um, <laughs> trust, trustee, that's it. So in prisons, right. If you're, if you're not a violent offender and they need a janitor instead of hiring a janitor, you'll, you know, okay. You can come out of your cell for eight hours a day and mop floors. Oh, okay, cool. Right. Um, so, so we're kind of trustees in this prison, and we've been given various tasks, right? We're, we're, we've been, um, there was a, a rat infestation in a building, and we had to go and come to find out there's this jackass druid who's summoning rats um, Gosh. Because, because he's in prison and he doesn't have anything better to do. So we wound up, <laughs> right. you know, we were going to. You're like, hey, man, we're here to clean up the rat problem. And he's like, oh, yeah, it's in the basement. And, of course, it's full of traps because he's trying to kill us to feed our corpses to his rats. Um, so there's there's all these little fun. And there's a whole, like, underground tunnel system, kind of like a la Hogan's Heroes, that the guards, they kind of know exist, but they don't know what's down there. And they, they're too afraid to go down there. Yeah. So our, our party has been tasked with kind of, mapping out the the tunnel system underneath the the prison um but many 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 sessions have kind of gotten into this rut where we talk to the guard the guard gives us a bunch of stuff to do it's due in 10 days we go off and we do the stuff we come back and the guard say oh cool you know you didn't die we were expecting you to die this time here's more stuff um and so it's it's um Rut's too negative. It's it's repetitive, right? I, I don't, yeah. I, I'm having fun, right? So I don't want to call it a rut, um, right. but but it is it is starting to smack of the repetitive, and there's some, I think there's a bigger story, uh, but we haven't found it yet, and we've been playing for months. Yeah, I feel like I need to to do something to to throw more of a clear objective at them. To prevent us from having, you know, going months without 
perceived progress. Sure. But again, it's is are people having fun? And and to my DM's credit, on Monday night, he he did he's at the end of the session. He's like, so how are folks doing? And it's like, well, you know, a lot of combat. We don't do a lot of role play. I don't know kind of where we're headed. Like, I, I think we're on the main storyline, but it feels like we keep doing side quests. Like, yeah, yeah, doing, um, a, doing a check in would be good. I think everybody's yeah. having fun. Yeah. But that was kind of the, that was that was my Monday. I mean, uh, Dalrea did amazing, scary things again. She she leveled up. She's level eight now. Oh, um, nice. That's where my party's at. She she took her two points in charisma, so she she's now at a twenty charisma. That plus five modifier is amazing, <laughs> terrifying. Uh, and uh, and so uh, she grabbed another spell. She was going to grab Dimension Door. Uh, but the but again the there's magic causing those spells to malfunction inside the prison so oh. um, she picked uh, compulsion instead nice so she can compel people to do things she's got polymorph she's got um, she's got a bunch of she's got fear curse she's 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 loaded up as a college of whispers uh neutral evil druid it's uh not druid bard not druid um, not druid i've never played a druid <laughs> never ever ever have i played a druid yes you did uh, in world of warcraft i have but no not in, in, in D D. yeah you played ignatius maple flange a gnome druid i did oh my gosh i did i totally forgot about ignatius that was like one of the first characters that you brought in back when we were playing like in greyhawk yes ignatius maple flange yeah, but... I I stole that name for the lore of my world. He's a, a gnomish druid who helped make peace between some elves and some dwarves. As long as you as long as you don't uh, well, I was gonna say just don't steal von Krumpus because I might want to play him in your world. But if yeah. you steal him, then I'll be connected to your world, and that'll be fine. I mean, no, I mean you're good. You you are welcome to play von Krumpus somewhere. I'd have to level him up to. I think he was level five or seven when we finished. Anyway, we're we're getting off topic. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. It was good. It so, was nostalgic there for a minute. <laughs> it was. It where it was. So, uh, last episode we talked about party composition and mission and vision and we've been very yeah we've been mechanical and technical right for yeah. a long time. For, yeah. for, for a lot a lot of these shows are getting into mechanics and roles and uh i do have a math we, show we, we talked um, about the math episode coming up too yeah i know i i'm trying to see if i can get a guest uh a guest uh for for that Ooh. um i gotta see if uncle matt will will uh wants to join in and and talk Ooh, uh, nice. that'd be good three-dimensional platonic solids and random true randomness and probability um and if he'll share some of his spreadsheets with us that could be fun that would be a lot of fun um, um, but this time we're going to be talking about improv um and so what what is what uh, it always feels like such a silly question but what is improv so improv is short for improvisation and it is a comedy or acting style uh, where you don't write a script and you just tell a story or react to uh, what's happening in your scene in a way that other actors or comedians can pile on, can embellish, can, can grow uh, the story. That's what improv like means I to me. I forget that last part a lot. Which is what? The that other people can build on. Cuz my my too long didn't read of that is that improv is just coming up with ideas on the spot. Making crap up. Yep, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but, but thinking about it in terms of so that other people can build on it is a that's a helpful it's a helpful way to think. Um, and, and so one of the things that I do that 
a, a classically trained actor uh, will probably take umbrage with is I also lump writing into that. So uh, I, I know, you know, purists out there are going to go, oh, improv is on the stage and live. It's like, yeah, okay. But um, also, I also lump in improvisational or extemporaneous writing uh, sure. in, in with that as well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I think writing is an excellent exercise in, in getting yourself a wealth of sort of mental ideas so that you can pull from those and, and improv better in the future. Yeah, I would call writing yeah. improv. Um, improv is obviously use, useful to both uh, players and game masters, but um, we can do sort of a, a quick list here. What, how is it used? How is how could improv possibly be useful for a player? So, trying to not be system specific, but there are systems out there, Seventh C, uh, where <laughs> you may you may have the narrative where something happens and and the DM or the GM looks at you and goes, "Okay, um, tell me about." this tell tell me about your first girlfriend who fell overboard and now that you're looking out over the sea uh you're remembering her tell us a tell us a short story about that that you don't have written because you that you don't expecting have... to be asked to tell a short story that evening right and yet here you are here you are or um You've rolled on your background table in the player's handbook or Xanthar's guide to everything, and it says something in there, right? Whatever those I, I have the books, I'm not going to open them up to the tables. That's okay. Uh, Cloistered but, Scholar. Okay, Cloistered Scholar, and now it's downtime, right? It's long rest time. You've done your five minutes of work for the day, and now you're long, you've talked your DM into a long rest at 9 a.m. <laughs> and uh, and now, okay, guys, role play. It's like, oh, it says here that you're a cloistered scholar. What does that mean? And tell, tell me about your, your time studying, right? And you can make something up and have a really good role play moment. No dice need to be rolled um, and just kind of chit chat and tell a story, right, and and have a good time. Yeah, just come up with stuff. Because if you get sure. asked something like that, chances are it's something that you've either, like, talked to ahead of time with your DM, or if you have that creative leeway, just come up with on the spot. Yeah, I went to the Gold Leaf Monastery, in the Everwoods, where I studied under the head Abbot Mortimer, and Abbot Mortimer and I got along, and it was a peaceful time studying beneath the golden leaves. Boom. There you go. Um, and obviously improv is useful for DMs in that rolling with those ideas, right? Thinking about improv as something to do that other players or the DM can build on. Um, you as the DM can then build on that either with the player or independent from the player. With is better, typically, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like you said, writing is, you know, if you're a DM who prepares a lot, writing is like 90% of what you do. So... <laughs> uh, me being one of those DMs, uh, although I'm doing a whole lot less of it during this campaign arc, I'm trying to do more of the the improv and and let the players drive the story. But I again, I feel like I'm gonna have to move away from that a little bit. Sure. Um, but improv is good for those DMs who like don't want to spend lots of time prepping for their sessions because um, there are have been points where I have spent you know four hours of prep for one time of of game play uh, so you know prepping for a three hour session takes two hours a night every day of the week um, 
So that, you know, that is a, that's not a, it's not a bad way to do it. If you like writing and you like homebrewing, um, and you have a, a good narrative that you want to share, but it's a lot of work. And if you get, if you are good or seek to improve your improv skills, you know, if you get good, um, you'll you'll have to not have to but you have the option to write less and still feel as confident in your ability to storytell and to weave a narrative that is compelling and coherent and avoids plot holes um, it definitely saves time to be able to whip stuff up it does yes it does so how do you get those skills um, I, I, I have the first thing on the list here is take a class, but, um, it, yeah, if that's something that you can do, probably not right now. Um, but if that is something that is available in your, where you live, um, then seeking an improv or acting class can be fun. Uh, I, I'm, see, I'm too introverted to go do something like that. Um, which is maybe where, like, my improv skills, like, not are, are hindered, but I, like, definitely feel more comfortable doing that in a session than I would in, like, a class. So while yeah. that is a, a commonly recommended thing, I, I'm not, I'm not endorsing it. <laughs> so, so there's, there, there, I've, I've been Googling a little bit for improv like tips and tricks and and there's a bunch of good web pages that just talk about how to do it um versus you know signing up to vermont community college and taking a you know theater 204 improv and comedy class mm -hmm. um so so that's i mean the online resources are are another way you can can do that um in, I, I added, watch the television show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Oh, sure. Yeah, that's a good so example. So if, if you've never, if, if, if you're still kind of fuzzy on what is improv and, and if you want to see professionals do it well, um, that's, that's, that's a, a great place to go. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just watch that TV show and, and, it's it's kind of structured like a game show. There are yes, there are professional comedians who who have uh, been doing this type of stuff for years. They're they're trained, talented professionals, but that those are good people to watch, right? If if you're watching a trained, talented professional doing improv, um, you'll pick up tips and tricks from them that you can use in your your experience. Yeah, good. It's a good show. It's funny. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, I yeah, I think uh, it, you know, Google, Google is your friend. Um, that sh couldn't be said enough. Uh, we should pass out stickers that say that. Um, but practicing, I think, is a good way to do it. Uh, and obviously, besides like just playing more sessions, um, I I often find myself like talking out loud to myself. Uh, as if I was one of my characters or NPCs just to, to sort of get in their head or to be in their head while I think as them to work out some of the development of them. So whether that's like, oh, how, what does this person think about uh, the king, you know? And it's the, yeah. the crotchety old sailor who runs their ex-sailor who runs the bar. Arg. The king be no friend of me. I I haven't been knowing him for very long. I moved here to retire, and he drain takes all of my taxes. Uh, you, you know, um, <laughs> or yeah. or how to how to segue into a, a quest giving moment. So you know the players might meet a character who they don't really have a reason to talk to, but that character needs to say something clever or punchy to get their attention to. To make them ask another question or to make them you know sort of care in the moment um or cinematic moments are fun to to practice 
and just you know trying out different you know ways that they would say it uh i guess that's sort of like the the overthinking mentality is like if you can think about every scenario that will happen then you'll be prepared for it um so that's that's kind which of is, my approach which, which is, is exhausting almost but... an antithetical to improv i know <laughs> right like try, trying to calculate every possible response is well not everyone um, but you know a good handful gives you the mental agility that you would need to to handle that with confidence sure and and there's nothing and and there's nothing wrong with a pause i i know oh, yep. that uh speech teachers uh all throughout high schools around America are going, well, you've got to keep talking, right? Or radio host, right? You've got to keep talking. You've got to keep your audience interested. It's like, you know, there's nothing mm. like a mm. good pause. And think. I did pause. not have that uh, instruction. I got that you should take pauses. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so at least we're teaching it correctly now. But yeah. there, there's, there is nothing wrong with, I've got, I've, I've got my salty sailor. He's in the bar. He's crabbing about the king's taxes, and he needs to talk to the party. And the party are like, you know, hey, sailor Joe, um, nobody likes taxes, and we're low on money. How, how could we earn some coin? And you haven't thought about using Sailor Joe as the motivator for for um for this particular party or the next action they're going to take. Um, just there, there's two schools of thought, right? Pause, think about something plausible, and and go with it. Or just a lot of improv coaches will just say 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 anything, right? Yeah. You know, oh, I got to scrape barnacles off of my boat. Can you help me? And and then it's like, oh, wait a minute. That doesn't sound all that exciting. Well, you know, these are magical barnacles, so the only way to scrape them off is to get the, the magical barnacle scraper, which is um, guarded by uh, these mermen in this cove over here. And now, you know, boom, I, <laughs> it, I, I just made all of that up. Yeah, but that see, like, so that immediately was like, oh, okay, the magical barnacle scraper is a trident. And they have to go get this trident from the mer people so that they can get barnacles off. Like that's a great story. Yeah, but and and that's and that's right. You gotta scrape barnacles off my boat. That's um. I I guess the 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 pause is if you tr if you if it needs to be plausible. That's the that I think that's I think that's the big catch for me. Um, and one of the things that hinders my improv is I focus on continuity and um almost to a detriment right i'm i'm a i'm a continuity guy mm -hmm. so um if i'm watching a tv show and hey that vampire is wearing his daylight ring on his right hand and then the next show next episode it's like shit he's got it on his left hand why do you, you know why is that and of course <laughs> The people who wrote the Vampire Diaries don't give a crap which hand the ring is on, but I I, I pick up on stuff like that. So right. again, I'm kind of mirroring myself or projecting my problems on my players. I I take that pause to make sure I'm not going to say anything really really crazy, and then I I jump, I go. Um, no, that's good. I I have a little bit of that because I am so uh, entrenched, if you will, in my homebrew world that I try to I have to I I like to do the say something to start creating that and then I'll pause shortly after once I have like the idea that I oh gosh now I really need to develop this um but that uh that pause oh shoot I lost my train of thought yeah we I think we were comparing oh. the amount of time between the pause and when you should jump and yep. say something say anything and, and reasons for the pause uh because i have so much i'm starting to amass a wealth of of world lore um for my homebrew world and so i'm trying to make sure that whatever i say is uh 
coherent and and contiguous with other things that I've said about different things in the world. Um, yeah, plausible, I guess. Like, re- realistic for the fantasy world. Yes. Yeah. And and here's the thing that I have to remind myself as a DM or a GM on a regular basis, and DCC and MCC are really good about this, is that in most of these settings, there isn't Twitter or a smartphone, right? I mean, in, in Traveler and Starfinder... There <laughs> is, but even Twitter and Google can be wrong. Yep. Right. So if you do like, oh, you know, you've got to get, I got barnacles all over my boat. I need the magical barnacle scraper. It's over here. Um, the mer people have it. And then you look at the map and you go, oh, they're in the middle of a desert. And this sailor moved to the desert because he got sick of, the ocean Hmm. um and well why the hell does he have a boat in the middle of the ocean well some wizard magicked it to him Uh, right or or um somebody trucked it to him there uh to to, because it was his boat and he wasn't paying his slip fees and now it's it's on a trailer outside the bar and everybody laughs at him because there's this trailer full of barnacle there's this boat on a trailer full of barnacles outside this bar in the middle of the (laughs) desert And and it's like, oh, well, where are these mer people? Oh, they're a thousand leagues to the north. Yeah, okay, well, we're not doing that today because a thousand <laughs> leagues to the north is too far to walk. Yeah. Um but there's lots of lots of ways that you can kind of the, the thing with improv is that you you're supposed to say yes and. So yep, my 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 I used to sail from the coast, which is a thousand leagues to the north but um the same jackass wizard that magicked my boat here as a prank um i stole this this mirror and it's a full length looking glass that you can walk through and you'll be in his study which is only a two-day walk to the beach so you know yes and it's a thousand miles away well i have a magic mirror that'll get you 980 miles done and now now i'm in this wizard's house well crap how do we get out of this without getting beat <laughs> yeah now we got to escape the wizard's house without get getting captured or or turned into frogs and then we have to walk to the the beach and now we I mean, we're continuing our adventure um, nice so so even if it's not plausible if you make a mistake don't like everybody makes mistakes so so don't i uh the the longer i play and the older i get the the less um i am inclined to retcon things interesting um, things that you say or things players say or both like okay. if if a player says it it happens right oh i i take his favorite flute and i break it because i'm sick of this bard playing music okay you broke his flute Hey, <laughs> yeah, you know you owe me a flute, and now it's it's like, oh, I take it back. It's like, no, 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 you you did it, you broke it. Well, yeah. well, now what do I do? Well, now you know you're lawful good, and you stole property and broke it. So let's see a charisma save to see if you're gonna have an alignment, a crisis in alignment, and you owe the bard fifty gold for breaking his favorite flute. And and don't expect bardic inspiration in the next fight because the <laughs> bard's pissed at you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so that kind of like that's that yes and yeah. kind of thing. I, I gave a negative um, example, but no, that's all right. I, I I think it made sense. Yeah. So I um kind of I have similar processes for you. I daydream. Um, like when I'm driving in my car and a car drives past, um, I daydream about where that person is going. Interesting. Or if I get behind somebody and they're going really slow, it's like, huh, I wonder why this guy's going really slow. Um, and, and sometimes I come up with interesting little stories and other times it's just, it, it doesn't work, but, 
Um, uh, I will give myself little creative writing assignments in my head uh, as my day uh, goes by. Nice. Um, the other thing I've I've got is uh, write and pass. So this is an exercise we did in some of my creative writing classes where uh, you do a quick write. Well, that a quick write also works for this, right? So um, randomly pick two words, right? Two English words. Carrot um, cabinet. Okay, so now you are going to write a story that involves carrots and cabinets, uh, and you set your timer for four minutes, and you write as fast as you can um, for four minutes, uh, and your story has to include carrots and cabinets. And then you take that and you hand it to another writer in the room and they have to still following the carrot cabinet modality uh work on your story interesting so so you you inherit a story which you have to read um and then as you, you get so many minutes to read like you get three minutes to read the story and then you get another four minutes to write and then you have to write as fast as you can um so that kind of write and pass uh, nice. If if you don't have a creative writing class that you're going to, well, uh, I did that with some friends in college just for fun. Yeah, we would just for write fun. A sentence, pass it. We were passing a, a laptop around, <laughs> writing a story about an ocelot. So the I mean the other thing you could do is if you're at a bookstore, uh, just take a picture, open up a book, a random book, just grab a book off the shelf in the fiction section. Uh, take a picture or read one page of the book and then continue the story. Ooh, that sounds fun. Um, and, and it doesn't, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not giving you a writing assignment where you have to sit and write for seven hours, but just, <laughs> you know, and, and you don't even have to write it down, but just read that page, you know, uh, whatever it is. And what, what you kind of think about what think happens next. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, I, I like that a lot. I like it's and being a DM is like assigning yourself that, you know, assignment anyway. Like you're kind of signing up for it. And so yes. whenever I sit down to like write D and D stuff, it's because that's you know this is what I signed up to do and I want to do it. And then uh, here we go, and we see what comes out of it. And and then I've got extemporaneous speaking um, on my on my list as well, which is um, so much fun. Actually, it's it depends. Uh, it can be fun, but sometimes it is just not great. Do you want, um, do you want to define that a little bit more? Sure. So extemporaneous speaking, uh, it's 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 a it's public speaking. Uh, you you basically. You get a topic, um, and you have a few minutes to prepare, and then you speak for five All to right. seven minutes. Sure. So, um, I'll give you a topic, John. The feasibility of faster than light travel. Okay. Okay, and then you'd have like three minutes, three to five minutes to look up the t like if you knew nothing about physics and and faster than light travel. Yep. <laughs> uh, you have you have three to five minutes much. to Google like the salient points, uh, and then you have five to seven minutes where you speak about faster than light travel in the twenty first century. That sounds more like a regurgitation exercise than a creative exercise, but I could be wrong. So so I think what it does is it forces you to very quickly kind of compartmentalize and categorize information. Oh, sure, sure. Because you can't just say, well, I mean, three to five minutes, let's say you get five minutes to Google and, and search and look up things, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're going to speak for seven minutes. Uh, it's going to take you probably 90 seconds to say, well, I went to Google and I learned about 
general and I just look I googled general relativity and special relativity and there's this guy Einstein and we don't do it right it's it's impossible we we think it's impossible right now because the, this other Wikipedia says we can't do it um and there's this guy Richard Feynman that talks about it and crap I'm out of time I'm out of information it's like oh <laughs> you have six minutes and 40 seconds keep talking <laughs> Right. So it, it's um, it kind of forces you into that. He, he, I have I have a little bit of information. How can I present it and embellish it in a way that isn't lying? Right. Oh, yeah. Right. Shit, we got faster than and the guys over in, at CERN in Switzerland have faster than light travel. Um, and they did it using. um bees <laughs> and and old muskets and it's like no okay now you're just making stuff up but right um that that extemporaneous speech is very um it it puts yeah. a little bit of pressure on you yeah that to, makes to sense. accomplish things um it it helps you kind of quickly categorize and sort information and then it makes you um present information in a way uh, that is memorable to your audience kind of thing. It's a, it's a, to Oh, so, and I didn't talk about Toastmasters, oh, but yeah, that's, sure. that's, a, that's a, that's an organization that probably not meeting in the age of COVID, but um, Toastmasters is a public speaking organization. It's kind of, it's a club. You, you join it. Um, they usually meet in a restaurant or, uh, you know, it's like the lions or the Kiwanis or the Knights of Columbus or, yeah, or no, the Shriners, I've been to one. right? Um, and, and same thing, they help you with public speaking because, right, more adults in America fear public speaking than fear death. So is that true? Uh, it is true. That's the, the number one fear of adults in the United States is public speaking followed by death. I think I thought, I'm going to look that. Was, I thought it was fear of the unknown. I would put snakes on there, but that's cause I, I don't like snakes. Um, no, I I see the value in in speeches like that now. Um, I I one of the 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 business consultant that I was meeting with, um, when we were when I was talking about forming Red Hoodie was, uh, or is rather in one of those Toastmaster clubs, um, and I went to one to to see it and to to present a like a 30 second elevator pitch um and it was it was interesting they have much longer to prepare than five to seven minutes but um but yes that's a, a good good resource um i like doing my daydreaming and thinking about D D when i am sort of zoned out at work because uh, I do a repetitive job so um, I think about D&D &D a lot and I have a little notepad in case I have ideas that I jot down real quick um, I both like and don't like jotting ideas down real quick because uh, I on one hand I end up with notepads or sticky notes with you know, two or like I'll have a st I have a sticky note hanging on a wall that says blueberry doily, and we have no idea what the context for that was. It's still funny to us, um, but I don't know where I was going to use that or what it meant. Um, but I, sometimes I'll have those notes where I've got you know a name or something jotted down, and I'll remember. Oh no, okay, that was this this end this wizard NPC who I wanted to make you know this other guy and. Um, so sometimes the quick note is good and sometimes the quick note is bad. Um, I also, I also like, uh, doing my D and D daydreaming in the shower. Um, <clears throat> I had just listened to uh, a podcast recently that was talking about, um, inflammation and its role in depression and stress. And, uh, one of the things that they were talking about was, was, you know, saunas or, or hot showers having sort of that de-stressing effect and I think part of that de-stressing leads to an increase in creativity which you get in a warm shower is that why I think better in a shower I it it 
so the sauna effect like that, having a, a an internal body temperature of what was like 101 or 100.1, I think it was 100.1, um, can actually help like reduce inflammation in your body. And inflammation is one of like the things that cause more, or so we suspect is one of the things that cause most of the issues that are commonplace. So, you know, if we can reduce it inflammation, um, then, you know, that is good for people. So yes, potentially. So I can send I'm... you that podcast later. I think it was uh, one of the Art of Manliness ones. Oh, cool. So I'm. I'll throw out another idea. Where uh, did you find? Did you? Where did we land on the uh, fears? So so I I have I haven't. I, I have to turn my VPN on to get. I, I'm I'm gonna get mom blog stuff if I Google it right now. Oh all um, right. I I'd rather go to my college library and pull like real. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Research instead of just. What do Americans fear most? Because it's, yeah, Google's going to tell me all sorts of crazy things like, you know, zombies and other weird stuff. But anyway, um, I am looking at it on the, well, I'm looking at the expansions on the shelf because I'm not sure where the base game went. But I would highly recommend playing, see if you can guess what I'm going to say, a game. It's a card game. It's a storytelling oh. card game. Oh, Buzz. Buzz. Go ahead. Is it The Fault in Our Stars? Uh, no. Oh. But that but um before there were stars Wait, is before, another yeah, That's a that's a book. Before there were st we'll we'll uh, I'll talk about Before There Were Stars here in a second. Um because that's also another fantastic storytelling board game that can help you with your improv. Uh, and you creativity. Were, you were thinking once upon a time. I am thinking once upon a time. I think you still have the base set because I'm looking at. I do. <laughs> seafaring tales and knightly tales and animal tales. Um, but so once upon a time by Atlas Games is a card game where you get a hand of eleven cards and you have to get rid of your whoever gets rid of all of their cards first wins. Like Uno. Like Uno, the cards have verbs. I'm sorry, the cards have nouns and adverbs, and there are some verbs um, on these cards. And you have to come up with, you, once upon a time, there was a witch, and you play the witch card. Yeah, and it's, she it's lived. Ca characters, items, settings, actions. Characters, items, settings, and actions. And so... You're telling your story. There was a witch, and she lived by a well. So I get to play the well card. Um, I can't stop for more than a small pause, or else someone at the table can call foul and take the story. We usually, so, we usually let it go, but... Well, it's it's kind of like when we were playing Munchkin, right? 2.6 seconds. <laughs> right, 2.6 seconds is... You know, half a second at some tables, twenty seconds at other tables. At other so. tables, right? So, so, but if you, and if you say a word, right? So there was a witch, she lived near a well, um, and she was m wicked. And if someone has wicked, the wicked card, they play wicked, and now they take over the story, and they have to continue the story. They can't just say, uh, "And the witch died, and now there's a horse," and play horse. Um, no, but who, I could say. The witch who fell down the well, uh, or I, I had wicked, was wicked. Though she did have one friend in her life, a horse, her companion right. Chestnut. Chestnut rode through the forest, and the next And I player, have forest, so I yeah. go, ah, I've got forest, and I play forest <laughs> and take over the story. Um, and, and so you go round and round and round uh, until you, every, someone gets rid of all their cards. Um, fabulous. Tremendously fun it's it's awesome fun and it helps you kind of you have to listen right i mean and and that's one of the things i i haven't hit upon from kind of my improv um is listening right mm -hmm. because you've got to set other people up for success now now not so much when you're playing once upon a time you really want to narrow that story down so you can pitch all of your cards problem is 
if you've shuffled appropriately, you're going to have you know, witch, well, dwarf, dragon, cave, uh, and it's like crap. How you know you, you're looking at eleven cards going? I don't know what I'm going <laughs> to yeah. say. Um, but in there. <laughs> but you've you've got to listen to the story because you people at the table. If you try that, like okay. There was a witch. She lived by a well, um, and and she was wicked. And John plays wicked, and he says, "Well." And then there was this horse in a village far away from the witch. It's like time out. You you can't just that. That's a veer, right? That's a metaphor. Sheer. You you're you know you're co- totally discounting the witch, um, and you the table can call foul and take a vote and and it's like yep. Forget you're you're done. Take your two cards for a penalty. Next person start playing. Um, so you it's, have to even still. That was it's been rare in the games that we've played, which I kind of like because then you get it, uh, for the sake of the game. Yes, it's very fun. Um, yes, and it's it's exciting for that to be competitive. Um, but for the sake of of improving your improv skills and applying that to to you know, 5e or or 7c or uh, any RPG, um, you you could play that with a group of people who are more about you know experiencing the story than stealing from it. You know, right? Then then trying to win the game. Yeah, absolutely. And that's and that brings me back to before there were stars. Before there were stars. Um, I'm trying to find the box. I think it's downstairs still. I was going to name the publisher, but I can't off the top of my head. Yeah, I um, but Before There Were Stars is uh, a storytelling game. You roll dice. They have these beautiful little dice that have star pips on them. And then you use the dice that you have rolled to build constellation and claim cards from a common supply. And the cards have nouns and right. They have creatures and settings. Um, Axe, forest, ring, dragon, serpent, island, and you. You're basically telling a creation myth. So you you take the the place of Confucius or Buddha or. Um, or one of the authors of the Old Testament, or or one of the Very Mayan early writers, right? And you are, you write it. You okay? In the beginning, all of reality was an island floating in the void, and lightning struck the island and created the stars and the planets, uh, and and that you tell the the story. You have to incorporate all of the cards that you've claimed from the supply. The The neat thing about this game is that everyone listens to the story, and then you have a little bag that you pass around, and each listener awards you a gem uh, that, is, <laughs> that, is, that is valued as... So the best story gets the... I think it's the yellow gem. Um and there's the yellow gem for the best story and blue gems for um, everybody I else. I think it's the other way around. Is it the blue The blue gem? It's like blue and yellow. Yeah, blue and you, special, yellow is regular. Special and yellow is regular. Um, and then, but it's, it's the traditional myth structure, right? So there's the creation story. There's the why are people the way they are story, right? So, right. Um, I'll get old Testament, biblical Judeo Christian on folks here, but the, the first phase is the creation, right? The seven days and oh, in seven, go. I've got right? the, it's it, chapter one is in the beginning, in the beginning. Right. And yep. then there's what's at the, the chapter at two, the dawn of civilization. Right. So what, how are like, this is the snake in the garden, right? Humans, humans were, peaceful and weren't civilized and then how did they become civilized what's number three uh a great hero emerges the hero's journey and then number four at the end of days is is revelations yep so 
So you, you, you go around four times telling these, making up these stories using the cards. And the cards you pick for in the beginning, you keep one or two of those uh, for at the dawn of civilization. And then yeah, you keep each, each consecutive so chapter builds builds on on the on the previous one so yeah. yeah that that is a tremendous amount of fun i think uh in the beginning my tribe um the 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 fir- the formless void the only thing in the formless void were the was the serpent and the shark and the shark ate the serpent and pooped out the lands <laughs> that was a, uh, yep that was a good one and, and it was fun. And of course, everyone around the table is having a good time. And it's like, oh, yeah, we're all living on shark. You know, all of reality is nothing but cosmic shark poop. Sure, of course. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but but that's it's there's games like that. Um, that's so I, that's before there were stars by smirk and laughter games. Smirk and laughter games. Yeah, I love those guys. Um and then I'll throw one more board game at folks because we're talking board games. Yeah, it's uh, playing games to learn games. That sounds like the kind of education this world needs. <laughs> yeah. So so I'm looking at it right now. Arabian Nights by Z-Man Games. And That's much heavier, though, yeah. It's much heavier. It's probably, I think it's still in print, but it might be pricey. Um, and... A lot of my board game friends don't like it because they don't see it as uh, a game where you can apply strategy. So the Arabian Nights by Z-Man Games is set in the hundred and the, the is it thousand and one or hundred and one tales of the Arabian Nights. Thousand and one tales of the Arabian Nights. Right. So there's Aladdin and the Magic Lamp. There's lots of Sinbad. Um and it is a board game. There's a big board. It's it's um, the Middle East, and you have a character, and you move uh, around the board. And when you arrive at a place on the board, you'll roll some dice or pull a card. I can't. I, I, one or the other mechanic, um, and you'll basically have a random encounter. So uh, think of the game as um, on my turn, I'm going to have a random encounter in some place. And then you have a chart and you can basically pick an action. So I've encountered a camel. Okay. I can fight the camel. I can befriend the camel. I can, uh, there's, there's a bunch of different activities I can do. Camel's probably a bad example. Um, but you know, there's oh, talk to, right. I got it. there's talk to, seduce, um, ignore, follow, uh, and and so I'm gonna follow this camel. I found this camel. He's he's you know three pip three spots on the board away from Baghdad. I choose the follow action, sure. and then and then that will give me a letter, and I use the that letter and some other numbers from the board and from others other places. And I have this big spiral bound book and I'll flip to the appropriate page and I'll read option A and it'll say you and, and the writing is a little uh, formulaic, but it'll say um, you you follow uh, this individual into a magical cavern and you are rewarded by finding a treasure worth uh, 100 rupees. So now I, I get 100 rupees. And then I move on to the next thing. But as yeah, far I, as like a story development, uh, that's that's where that's where this game becomes fun because as you're hey I, I followed this camel and I got a hundred gold and the next player encounters a beggar and they're like I'm gonna give I'm gonna be charitable to the beggar and it's like well the beggar steals all your money and now you have no money and you have to go back to Baghdad it's like oh great. <laughs> You know, you follow the camel, you get a hundred rupees. I help the beggar and I get robbed. And and as you're playing the game, kind of this like Sinbad followed the camel. And then on Sinbad's next turn, he encountered a witch and uh, he tried to seduce the witch and she turned him into a dog. It's like, OK, great. Now I'm a dog. And my next turn, 
I show up in 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 uh, Riyadh as a dog, and the I f- encounter a guard who beats me up and says, like, oh, you know, I turned into a dog. I got beat up by the guards. I followed a camel. It, you kind of build this experience uh, using these uh, passages in this book. It's it's. I, th- um, I think the hang up would be that it sounds like a choose your own adventure book, but instead of me getting to sit down and read that at my pace, I have to like, I get to read a chapter of mine. Somebody else reads a chapter of theirs. Somebody else reads like at that point, just sit down and play D and D. You know, I it it is. I I think the it's more for some folks it's more approachable than D and D because it's very like structured. Like, true, I true. I have my my chart tells me the the actions i can take right so mm-hmm. um i don't want to bust the box out let's see if i can find it online no that's all right i, I think we got it right yeah, yeah. F- follow talk fight run be charitable convince, seduce charitable. convince yeah that kind of stuff yeah um yeah so once upon a time before there were stars and arabian nights um Ta- yeah the tales tales of the arabian nights tales of the arabian nights all right yeah um nice nice so and so using board game using games to learn games i think is a great strategy uh to help with improv um and then other like tips and tricks that that you might do uh i i like to to pull lines from movies or tv shows that i know my group has seen um it's easy for you to recall uh, if you are pulling from a character. Uh, it's easy to give some flesh to an NPC in a quick moment where, you know, oh, you encounter another wizard. Well, what does he look like? Uh, well, he is, he's he got, like, gray Gandalf robes, um, but hair like Snape. Um, and he, he looks kind of kind of crotchety. Um, and, and old but like you that immediately gives you an idea of what that character looks like um by pulling from things that you know people at your tape your party at your table would be aware of um and, it's also sometimes easy for easy for a good laugh <laughs> um easy for, to pull ideas from yep you you the little boy looks at you and slaps his face like kevin in home alone ah! yep i immediately Right. And and the nice and again, we, we improv is about giving people a chance to connect with what's going on to and build on it to like build on it said earlier. I like that a lot. So so by by invoking uh, Kevin McAllister's image, right, everybody in the table who's seen Home Alone or Home Alone 2 or instantly memes. gets this picture <laughs> of this little boy. And and can kind of latch on to that creatively and and use it, mm-hmm. which happened. I mean that that happened during Seventh C, right? A little bit. He, that that character that character was supposed to be a throwaway mook, and now he's written into the module. <laughs> and and that's I, that's one thing. Um, I, I can see your bullet here that says, "Don't worry about unimportant things." Um. Well, until and, you need to, right? But like, sure. you didn't have a. So we're talking about a case where there was this servant boy, um, and he comes to one of the character, one of the player characters' uh, rooms in the morning to to wake them and tell them breakfast was ready. And that character is a a, a Jenny, which is a polite term for courtesan for that you know world. Um, and so she comes to the door, but naked. And... Well, so so she said I answered the door, and as the GM, I I was having a little fun, right? I was like, well, you didn't say you put any clothes on, and you're a Jenny, so I'm assuming you're you're sleeping in relatively risque um, apparel. So she was like, Ooh. nope, I sleep naked, naked, and it, and and that's 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 a great back and forth of like so. so I, I made an off con. I don't think it was off color comment, but no, right. I, I had a, the player. I asked for clarification, like, okay, I'm, you know, there's a bang on your door breakfast in 10 minutes, breakfast in 10 minutes. 
uh, I answer the door. It's like, you know, you didn't say you'd put any clothes on. And, and, and this is credit to the player. She was like, you know, you're right. I sleep naked. So you're answering the door naked. And the yes, little eight-year-old eight boy, right? Yes, and. So she answered the door naked. An eight-year-old boy sees boobies, uh, does the Home Alone thing, ah, and runs runs away embarrassed. Um, and and that little interaction wasn't planned. It wasn't written. It wasn't scripted. Uh, but it created a moment in the game that everybody enjoyed. Yeah, no, it was fun, <laughs> fun funny. Yeah. Um, it was it was funny. It was fun, and that NPC started to take on a, a role or a or a persona that was, you know, I had never planned. Right, and I could have said, "Well, he's not in the story, you know. Forget it. He just let's off off. You know, he goes off camera and he he disappears." It's like, wait a minute, you know. Well, it's it's like the drummer in the in the cantina band in Star Wars. Where is that guy? <laughs> well, he's he's not important to the Star Wars story, right? We Where we don't see now, you know. But that's that's a great improv or creative writing prompt. Like, where is that guy now? Yeah. Right. And and take ten minutes and think about the drummer from the cantina band in the first Star Wars movie. You know, uh, is he still drumming? is you know is yeah. he married does he have does he have a family does that species he's, he's drumming get forever. married right so so that's that's that and then yeah i i like this don't don't sweat the small stuff don't worry about the like what's he wearing oh yeah okay you pause or take a breath what kind of we're we're in a city it's a he's a middle class merchant. He's probably not wearing full plate mail armor. Um, but if you do, even if you say, well, he's wearing full plate. So, like, well, why? Well, this is my father's plate mail armor. And I'm you know, this is the anniversary of the battle of whatever, where my father fought. So I'm donning his armor today. I normally don't wear this stuff. It's wicked heavy. <laughs> um, no, so that's, that's terrific. But that's, but that's, you know, oh, I made a mistake. Shit, this guy shouldn't be in full plate. Well, you know, there, there's a hundred reasons why um, somebody is doing something. Right. And, and sometimes, right, what's the, what's the reason? Um, there isn't one. I just, today I felt like blah, right? I wore cowboy boots the other day and my wife was that looking at me and she's like, what are you wearing those for? It's like, you know what? Today feels like a black cowboy boy boot day. <laughs> and, and you know, the, your, your NPCs, you develop as a DM or a GM, right? That they are based on people or creatures or, um, or entities or computers, right? right. Uh, if you're There's playing paranormal. usually some influence. Right. So, so... There's nothing wrong with borrowing from what exists, okay? Yeah. Um, and there's nothing wrong with doing something wacky. Uh, one, one of the things I like to do or I try to challenge myself to do as a G GM is pick something that doesn't fit and see if I can make it fit. <laughs> Which and, could uh, be a, a good creative exercise as well. Yeah, and, and sometimes it works great, and other times it falls flat. Um, but that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I say don't worry about the unimportant things, but I'm I'm that DM who likes to do a lot of the writing, so I'll try to come up with names for people. Because my, my players ask, like, oh, what's this guy's name? Like, to the people who I don't expect them to. So I, I usually keep a couple of spare names on hand somewhere. Um, I think I've got a list somewhere that's got like 40 unused you're, names for various races and things. You're so kind to your players. <laughs> and other you, times I'll just call them Bob or Joe or Steve, like the most uh, nondescript, boring names. No offense. 
No, but yeah, I, I, I see. So I take a different tract with, with that. So if, if I've got a group and they just are wandering around, I mean, think of it like this. When was the last time you walked into a, a convenience store to pay for your gas and you asked the person in line behind you what their name was? I don't know that I ever have. Ever have. And what would you expect that person to do if you turn around and go, hey, buddy, what's your name? Imagine you're um, imagine you're in line, right? You're in line at McDonald's or Wendy's or wherever, right? And the guy picking up his order picks up his Big Mac and chocolate shake and turns around and goes, "Hey, pal, McDonald's is pretty busy today, huh? What's your name?" It's like, uh, my yeah, name? yeah, it is. And I'm then I'm, quiet. I'm customer number four hundred two, and I'm waiting for my fillet of fish. Get the hell out of my <laughs> way, right? I mean, you. I, I, I'm joking. I wouldn't be rude to somebody like that, but that's weird. Like, right. Um, yeah, it's very strange. You know, if, if, if you're in a medieval setting and you walk into the store and you're strangers, like, um, you know, uh, Garth, the shopkeep, <laughs> everybody else in town knows Garth. They grew up with Garth, right? Garth and the rest of the town haven't been more than three miles away from the town in their entire lives. Mm -hmm. So nobody's going to call Garth, you know, hey, how you doing, Garth? Right? They're going to call each other by their first names, and your players may pick up on that. But if they walk into the store, right, walk into the store, what's your name? I'm I'm the guy who owns the store. Who the heck are you? You know, you you're new. You you're weird, strangers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's maybe I just RP my shopkeepers is too optimistic. <laughs> or give them name tags. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's a good idea. I like that. Um. I mean, yeah, it, but and... not not don't worry about their names. Uh, but the name isn't as important as like their place in the story. Um, cause I still can't, is, it's not Luigi. What's that little guy's name? Luigi. Oh, it is Luigi. All right. It see? is Luigi. Excellent. I gave him, Excellent. I gave him, he's, he's Mario's brother, Luigi. Terrific. <laughs> he, um, he's a Vidacci child. So I was like, little guy, Italian sounding name, Luigi. Nice. There you right? go. And, and, and he got named in all of six seconds because I needed to give the poor guy a name because he, he entered the story and stayed longer than, than I intended. And I doubted my ability to remember the name, but totally remembered how he factored in. And then he's got a mom now, who, again, was supposed to just be... I mean, be... he always had a mom. Luigi's always had a mom. But the <laughs> mom, again, was just kind of... She she was there to prove that there's blackmail happening. Um, and, and she was supposed to kind of educate the party about the the political and social structure that is vadachi right she's a commoner she's obviously had a liaison with a noble if if the noble family is going to be embarrassed uh they're not going to bat an eyelash about getting rid of a commoner you know in the standard medieval european renaissance way right which is right. uh drowning you've been oh you know she's she's stealing grain from the stable throw her in prison for the rest of her life where you know she'll die um you know, her her life will be forfeit my life will be four feet no forfeit um and and so the party like oh got very empathetic again i didn't think you guys would would uh go to those lengths to to uh to assist lorena who got a name yeah, um, I don't know. I'm I'm playing my character more heroically than I thought I would, which which is fabulous, um, and it has opened a lot of doors for me as as a GM. Well, right? good. There's I another mean, tip: is you know have a a good. Obviously, you're going to have a decent relationship with the people that you're playing with, but if you need that sort of inspiration, having that trust between player and DM to be like, oh, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you this lead, and you see what you do with it. Oh, you did something cool with it? Cool. I'm going to build on that. Is a nice, that's a good, yeah. it's a good flow. And, and it's, and that trust kind of works both ways because you've now 
given me an NPC that your care, your party has kind of adopted and cares about. Yes. Right. So as a, as a GM, I, I could leverage that to create, um, tension, tension, anxiety, (laughs) drama, stress, um, rage. Right. I mean, uh, I've, yes, I've got a villain. And if, if you guys are just not hating the villain enough, right. Got a way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. We know we've got a way to do it, (laughs) but that's, but that's trust, right? Yeah. Um, you're trusting me to use that appropriately, not just like, Oh yeah, you know, I'm sick of Lorena. So in the next scene, she gets washed overboard and eaten by sharks. And you guys are gonna be like, Hey, wait a minute. What do you mean she's washed overboard and eaten by sharks? That's bullshit. We just gave her to you and, and you're going to throw her away like trash. It's like, no, I won't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but if I need to, right, I can I can leverage that. And and I think we, we talked a lot about that in session zero anyway, um, about what people's kind of limits were for stuff. So so I, I have a good idea of what you guys are going to tolerate and what you won't tolerate, right? We're not, sure. we're not going to see... Uh, a villain sexually assault Lorena. We're not going to see children right. being killed, right? We've mm-hmm. we, we've kind of laid all that out as the, these are the things that are acceptable for pathos and and rage and and drama. And these are the areas that's just not fun. Like we don't want to play a game that's depressing and sad. Yep. Um, yeah, but that's all all good session zero stuff. Right. Yep. And that and that'll help you as you're doing your improv stuff, because you'll know like, okay, murdering children's off the table. So if I have to say yes, and it's like, wow, you know, the car crashed and, and, or the carriage crashed and Luigi was in the carriage. It's like, yes, the carriage crashed and poor Luigi was in the carriage, but at the last moment he jumped in a treasure chest and he's locked in the chest now and nobody has the key. Oh, he might he might suffocate. You've got you know, as soon as seven raises are spent, Luigi will expire. Oh man, go right. And Oof. but it's but it there's a chance to save him. No, there's, that's good. It's so good. It, but that's but that's that's yes and right. And mm-hmm. and again, these I, I this is all right off the cuff. I haven't prepared any of this. I didn't spend any time. Uh, if you can see my contribution to this week's show notes, it's like seven words. It was terrible. <laughs> no, uh, it's it is all good. But this is this is the the power of yes and okay yes and he crashed. It doesn't mean he has to die, right? Um, and we talked a little bit in previous uh, episodes about fudging roles, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, for for other systems which are more like okay, you know. Yep, you're trying to save the orphans and the green dragon is breathing its cloud. Everyone make a saving throw. Oh crap, half the orphans failed their saving throw. Well, it, that doesn't as the as the DM, right? It doesn't mean they have to die. Right. Right? It means Well, rules is written it does. Okay. But if you're yes, rules is written it <laughs> does. And throw if you're that party, out. <laughs> But but it doesn't doesn't necessarily mean you have to follow, right? Remember, exactly. rule one is fun. So if you know a a stack of dead children is going to really bum your players out, then you know the green dragon breathes across the fleeing orphans, and half of them drop gasping for breath, and they're passed out, and they're starting to turn blue, right? And then just you know they they look dead. The dragon again. If you're a six hundred year old green dragon. How nutritious is a seven-year-old? I mean, it's not. You're probably it's just not. killing them for fun at that point. At that point, right? You're killing them for fun. You're killing them to prove a point. You're 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 just being a jackass. You're probably up to horses and oxen, stupid and green dragon, owl bears, right? <laughs> you're you. It's like yeah, they're gonna scoop up a even a classroom full of seven-year-olds isn't gonna be. It's that's not even an. It's like a, a handful snack. of popcorn. It's like it's like half a piece of popcorn, right? And when was the last time you cut a piece of popcorn in half and ate it? Never. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's that's you know, I, I, like I said, I, 
it part back in the show. I, I don't like to retcon things, um, but so you do have to pay attention, right? When you mm-hmm. when you're improving, you just can't say whatever. I, I know some coaches are going to say, "Oh no, you say whatever pops into your head." Um, we have to temper that a little bit as a dungeon master because you have your session zero boundaries that you really don't want to break because you're gonna, you know, you're gonna make the game uncomfortable for your players. Yeah. You want to make sure you fit in canon, right? Because as much as I think Loth is is cool and wonderful, um, you know, I'm going to take that back. I was going to say, as much as I think Loth is cool and wonderful, she isn't just going to stop off and and say, hey, here's a dozen roses and a bottle of champagne and 500 gold, because I think you're cute. Um, (laughs) No, she's not. (laughs) You know, but here's the thing. She might. Because she's a demon goddess of chaos. And if she bestowed a boon on a lawful good dwarf in front of a bunch of drow, what better way to start chaos? That's true. You know? So here here I'm trying to think of this thing that violates canon. And it's like, you know, no. (laughs) It might be okay. Yes, and. Yes, she does show up and give this lawful good dwarf a boon. And why did she do it? She's the demon, uh, the spider queen of chaos. Like, maybe she's screwing with people. Yeah. No, no, right. that's a great, great thinking. Yeah. The the building on things that, you know, because you're creating the story collectively. You're creating the experience collectively, unless you're playing a module. But um, even then, you have, Weak. often you have some room to to do some of that. Yes, um, even then you have something that you are contributing or changing. I mean, we played, I think I've talked about this in previous shows, but we were playing Tomb of Annihilation, and mm-hmm. we were in the sub-quest where we're helping the little frog people who are being um, tortured so that the yuan can make this wander-lost drug. And, of course, the module calls for the party to liberate the camp and befriend the frog people. I forget the race of the frog people, but um, no, that's okay. A, yeah, you've you, you've mentioned this. Yeah, because I I played I I was role playing a drow, and anything that's not drow is garbage. So um, any race that's not drow is beneath notice. Um, again, that's that method actor in me coming. <laughs> but but so so the party is like doing all of this planning like we're going to attack at night we're going to open the slave pen first and we're going to collect a bunch of sharp we're going to sharpen a bunch of of sticks and give them a bunch of rocks so they can kind of fight their way you know we'll do a fighting retreat through the jungle and and of course here's my chaotic evil uh drow cavalier and he goes ah yeah i'm not doing that and the party's like what the what are you doing he's like these people have an enterprise and they're making money and i could give this to my aunt who's a matron mother uh, and she could sell this 10 times what they're making in Port Naranzaru. The, the, the quest is stop the drugs from coming into the city, not destroy the source of the drugs. And everyone's like, <laughs> Oh my God, what is wrong with you? And it's like, well, why don't you guys hang out here and make your plans? That's cute. I'm going to take a walk and, and see if I can clear my head and try to wrap my mind around what you crazy surface people are talking about. And what does he do? <laughs> He goes to the head Yuan T, who happens to be a female, and it's like, "Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna roll a seduction roll," and I nat twenty on the seduction roll, and the whole module, that whole chapter in the book, right? Uh, Out my the poor, my poor DM is like, "Great, you know, I paid fifty bucks for this hardcover book, and here's forty pages. I might as well just rip them out." It's like, "Don't rip them out," <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we're not doing that. Like, and and. Yes, and my DM, thankfully, uh, believes in yes, and. So, yes, and. I I started bringing the drugs into a warehouse in the city. Um, I didn't distribute them in the city. I put them onto uh, floating disks and dimension doored them to uh, a warehouse outside Ched Nazat. Because my matron, my aunt is a very powerful matron mother. Now, I didn't benefit from any of that, right? My DM was like, mm-hmm. you can do all this, but I ain't giving you squat for gold. It's like, oh, okay, fine. Mm-hmm. I got XP. We got XP for the encounter. Nice. Um, but the 
hundreds of thousands of gold pieces that I'm making my noble house, I don't have access to. <laughs> that makes sense. Well, I'm only a male. Yep. You know, if I was a female, they probably would have cut me in on a percentage. But, um, but that's that's yes and that's the power of yes and 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 my group to this day remembers that Quandor Zavir, Sir Quandor Zavir, seduced the Yuan Ti lady and basically betrayed a whole race of <laughs> of NPCs that we were supposed to use later on in in the adventure. Um, yeah, they, they don't let me forget that. They're like, you know, you made this a lot harder on us because you did this, this. It's like, yeah, I know. I'm, but those, I'm it's so, those memorable I'm so moments old. that are like why we play the game. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think in in sort of a summary of, of points, um, we you touched on it, but just to flesh it out a hair more, uh, was listening is just a, as big a part of improv as speaking is. Um, cause you have to, like you had said earlier, you have to follow the story and, and make sure that you're building upon other things and leaving space for your ideas to be built upon. Um, so, you know, listen, listening to understand, not only to respond, um, is, is sort of something to keep in mind in regards to that. Uh, and then, like you said, right at the beginning and that I have come back to, because this is not, I am going to think more of this in the future. Um, but creating things such that others can build upon the things that you've created. Um, you know, the, the and isn't self-serving so much as it also is, you know, party collective serving. So I, I really like that. Cool. Yeah. Do you have any, any final thoughts here? I, I don't. Wrap up? I I'm, mean, I'm, is... I'm, I'm, so, so. I do. I, I, I hear it. I do. And here I do. No, go ahead. Um, so one, one of the other things that we have, um, that I have done is think about your personal creativity. And, and this is another exercise, uh, that I picked up in, in my liberal arts education, uh, is listen to your own kind of mind and daydreaming and for a week kind of keep track of when you feel the most creative. Make it, this is called a heat map, okay? Uh, make a heat map of your creativity. Productivity people will say the same thing. Like when you have energy and you're really ready to work and do, do your job, like give yourself five points and when you're like, oh my God, I have to get a cup of coffee. And if that phone rings again, I'm, I'm putting my head in the, in the microwave, right? You give yourself zero <laughs> points. Um, but if you, if you kind of, uh, build some self-awareness about when you're the most creative, um, that will help you when it's like, when, when, when should I play? Right. Sometimes you can't, right. I mean, right. If, can't if, get a D and D group together at 3am in my shower on a Sunday. So on a Sunday, no, but, it, but if you realize that by Thursday, right or wednesday let's say wednesday hump day right everybody hates hump day uh wednesday is when you're most the most drained don't play on wednesday um or don't prep on wednesday right wait yeah. until you're creative um and those juices are flowing and then and then prep but but that kind of creativity productivity heat map is a is a good kind of self-awareness exercise uh that can help you um and even if you can't play when you're the most creative that's when you're like hey i'm taking you know if three in the afternoon on a Thursday is when you're most creative and you've got a flexible enough lifestyle, like take your lunch at three, right? Take your lunch at three, go to the subway, grab a sub and sit there with your book or your tablet or your smartphone and tap out something. Yeah. Right. Um, so that, that's my parting shot. And now, I'll, now I'll be, now I'll stop saying yes. And see, <laughs> that's, that's the other risk that you run into. Um, is that you'll just keep going. Yes, and, yes, and, yes, and, yes, and. And, and uh, you have to be, again, we, we go back to listening. I'll bring this back to listening, and I'll listen because uh, we're out of time. <laughs> um, but you want to you wanna make sure that you listen so that you know when to stop yes, and, and let somebody else take over. That's that's a good good closing tip, and uh, maybe a sec, next, I think next week, or not next week, but next episode we'll do our 
our seven C deep dive, that this could be a, a little bit of a bridge to get us over to uh, how to play NPCs and big bad evil guys so that you can stop yes ending the story and start a new one. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yep. But yeah, uh, no, that's, you know, cr create so others can build upon what you've created, listen to understand, not only to respond and think about your personal creativity. Keep track of your creativity and exercise it uh, when you are are most or best able to. Uh, so that's going to do it. Set the Table, episode 14. Um, if you want to uh, give us a quick comment, ask us a question, say hello, uh, you can do so on Twitter at JMScota5 or at Red Hoodie Games. Uh, you can also find all of our previous shows up on YouTube. Just look for Set the Table um, episode, whatever you're looking for. Uh, I have found out that Apple Podcasts only shows the three most recent episodes. Um, so I'll investigate that at another time. Uh, and if you would like to help out by any more than simply giving us a, a view or a listen, head on over to patreon.com slash skoda, that's S-K-O-D-A, um, and for even a dollar, you can join us in the patron discord, hang out, chat, ask questions to be answered on the show, so on and so forth. Um, so that's going to be it for me and for Jack. Thanks a whole bunch, and we'll see you next time. Good day.